Good day, students. So this topic is a continuation of the discussion that we have in the lecture, which is the liver function. So for the learning objectives, at the end of this lesson, the student is expected to determine how the body metabolizes bilirubin, identify the different tests and principles in bilirubin determination, and lastly, determine the techniques in handling specimen intended for bilirubin assay. So to begin with, let us first determine on how the body metabolizes bilirubin. So this bilirubin is also a bile pigment. I know you already have an idea what is a bile. So this bile pigment bilirubin is formed from the breakdown of what protein molecule? Okay, from the breakdown of hemoglobin. And you have to take note that each hemoglobin consists of four protein chains. So it's dependent on what type of bilirubin we are talking about. So like for example, if we are talking about hemoglobin A1, so which is predominant in, in adult hemoglobin. So there are two alpha chains and two beta chains. Whereas for hemoglobin F, which is predominant in the fetus, we have two alpha chains and two gamma chains. So in short, we have all in all a total of four protein chains in each hemoglobin molecule. And also, another thing, each hemoglobin contains a porphyrin ring and an iron atom. So we have porphyrin, porphyrin ring, and iron atom. And what will happen here is that when the hemoglobin is metabolized, this iron will be removed from the hemoglobin and will be recycled to make more hemoglobin. So this iron will be recycled in making new hemoglobin, whereas these protein chains, this one, they will be hydrolyzed back to the constituent amino acids. So they will become again amino acids in the creation of new proteins. So in short, nothing is wasted in here because the iron is converted or recycled back to make more hemoglobin and the globin chains are recycled back or hydrolyzed back in order to make new amino acids. How about this one? The porphyrin that is being left. So the porphyrin ring now will break and we will form this cyclic structure. So we will have now this biliverdine. So this is another derivative of your hemoglobin. So this derivative, the initial derivative of this hemoglobin is what we call as the biliverdine. So it's a green pigment. So further reduction of the enzyme biliverdine reductase um, with, of course, the NADPH as your coenzyme will lead to the formation of this water-insoluble bilirubin. So this is also known as the B1 or what we call as the unconjugated, unconjugated bilirubin. So that's the other name of this water-insoluble bilirubin. So again, when initially formed, the bilirubin is insoluble in water. So since it is insoluble in water, it is also insoluble in our blood. So it needs to be carried by another protein. And this time, this B1 will be carried by a protein known as albumin. So the binding is not covalent or non-covalent. But we have um, another bilirubin. We call it as delta bilirubin. So this delta bilirubin is bound to your albumin in a covalent fashion, meaning to say it is tightly bound to the albumin. So that is our delta bilirubin. So once the hemoglobin now, which is water insoluble, is bound to the albumin, it will be carried to an organ. So it will be carried to our liver. So the protein and which is the albumin and the bilirubin complex will reach the liver and now the, the bilirubin will pass through the liver cells and it is in an active transport process. So the mechanism is an active transport, meaning to say it uses energy as it passes through the liver cells. And after the molecules enter the hepatocytes, they attach now to another proteins. So we have now another proteins, the ligandine and Z proteins. So these proteins are soluble transport proteins found in the liver. So outside of the liver in our blood, the bilirubin, the B1, is carried by the albumin in a non-covalent fashion 
and it will be carried towards the liver and it will now be attached to another proteins, the ligandin and Z proteins. And another thing, there is one or there are two glucuronic acid molecules that will attach to this bilirubin molecule mediated by an enzyme UDP glucuronyl transferase. So let me write that one. So UDP glucuronyl transferase. So this is an enzyme that mediates the attachment of glucuronic acid of glucuronic acid to the um, bilirubin molecule. So the meaning of UDP there is uridine diphosphate. So uridine uridine diphosphate. Okay. Next one. So the formation of the glucuronyl conjugate this one so, the formation of the glucuronyl conjugate now makes the bilirubin soluble in water. So, from here, the bilirubin is still insoluble. So, it will be carried by the albumin towards the liver and it will be attached to two proteins, the ligandine and Z proteins. And the glucuronic acid molecules will be attached to bilirubin with the help of the enzyme UDP glucuronyl transferase that will now form another type of bilirubin which is the bilirubin diglucoronide or this is already your B2. Is it a conjugated or unconjugated bilirubin? So this is already a conjugated bilirubin and again this is already water soluble. So you have already the B2. And the conjugated bilirubin, the B2, can then be excreted into the bile and into the small intestine. And once in the small intestine, okay, we are already here. So once in the small intestine, there is little absorption of the bilirubin molecules here. And the glucuronic acid portion is hydrolyzed in a variety of processes, leaving the newly unconjugated bilirubin to be metabolized by the bacteria in our small intestine. And bilirubin... Uh, bilirubin reduction will occur and what will be produced is the urobilinogen molecule. So again, metabolism of the bilirubin by the bacteria in our intestine will form this molecule, the urobilinogen. And then this um, urobilinogen can enter the hepatic circulation and can also be excreted in the bile. And also, some of it can be filtered by the kidneys and can be excreted in our urine. So it is excreted in the urine as urobilin. And another one, um, the oxidation products of urobilinogen, this one, so are also formed in the small intestine because of this bacteria and also the end products are excreted not only in the urine but also in the feces. So it is excreted in the feces as stercobilin. So this stercobilin gives the feces its characteristic color. So that is how the bilirubin is being metabolized by our body. So again, bilirubin is the breakdown product of what protein molecule? The hemoglobin molecule. For the bilirubin determination, we have two methods here, the evelyn malloy method and the gendrosic groff method. So the evelyn malloy uses 50% methanol as an accelerator or solubilizer, whereas the gendrosic groff method uses caffeine benzoate as accelerator. So this accelerator is added because the unconjugated bilirubin, the B1, reacts slowly. So these accelerants, such as caffeine or methanol, are used to measure the total bilirubin. So this one, the accelerator, enables the reaction of B1 with diazole reagents. And again, um, this bilirubin is an excretory product. This bilirubin is excreted from the bile. And it's also a product which um, comes from the catabolism of heme and the breakdown of the hemoglobin molecule. And for the principle of bilirubin determination, we have this Vandenberg reaction. So that is the basic principle involved in Evelyn Malloy and Gendrosic Groff method. And this is um, the reagent, the diazole reagent. So it contains diazotized sulfanilic acid. So, which contains sulfanilic acid in hydrochloric acid with 
sodium nitrite and also it contains methanol as an accelerant if we are talking about Evelyn Malloy. For the principle involved in the determination of our bilirubin, so we have here the Vandenberg reaction. So in this principle, when the diazotisulfanilic acid present in our reagent reacts with the bilirubin in our specimen, it forms a product. So we call it as the azobilirubin. So that is a purple colored product. And we will have an idea that we have an increased conjugated bilirubin or B2 if it gives a purple color immediately right after the addition of the diazotisulfanilic acid from our reagent. So that is why it is a direct positive. But we will have an idea that we have an increased unconjugated bilirubin or the B1 if it gives color only after the addition of an accelerator. So like for example, after the addition of a methanol. So it is an indirect positive result. And we also have a biphasic result. There is an increase of B2 and B1. So that is for your Vandenberg reaction. So for the Evelyn Malloy method, it still follows the Vandenberg reaction. So the bilirubin present in our specimen when added with a reagent, the diazotisulfanilic acid, will form a product, so which is purple colored. So we call it as the azobilirubin. And this is a colorimetric method wherein the intensity of the purple color that is formed after the addition of reagent is proportional to the bilirubin concentration present in our specimen. And again, the addition of methanol, so for Evelyn Malloy, will serve as an accelerator in order to measure or to detect the indirect bilirubin. So in this case, so one minute after the addition of sulfanilic acid, so right after addition of sulfanilic acid, there is a color development. So that is again our direct bilirubin. So like five minutes after the addition of methanol or accelerator, we can measure the total bilirubin. And the difference of values between total bilirubin and direct bilirubin is the indirect bilirubin. So in short, we have here the indirect bilirubin is equal to total bilirubin minus the direct bilirubin. Or we can say the total bilirubin is equal to direct bilirubin plus the indirect bilirubin. But in this case, the indirect bilirubin for the Evelyn Malloy is computed manually because right after the addition of methanol, we can get now the total bilirubin concentration. And next one, we have here the accelerator again in the Evelyn Malloy, the methanol. And this is the content of our reagent. So we have the diazo A. It contains 0.1 sulfanilic acid with HCl and of course 0.5% sodium nitrite. And again, the final reaction is the conversion of a pink solution to purple azo bilirubin. For the gendrosic growth method, this still utilizes the principle of Vandenberg reaction. But this one, this is a popular technique for discrete analyzers. So these discrete analyzers are type of automated um, chemical analyzers that we use commonly in the clinical chemistry laboratory in which this type of instrument performs tests on samples that are kept in discrete containers. So this is in contrast to what we call as the continuous flow analyzers because these continuous flow analyzers, in contrast to the discrete analyzer, this one um, separates the specimen through the use of air bubbles. And also, this method is not falsely elevated by hemolysis. So remember, your bilirubin is a breakdown product of hemoglobin molecule. So when there is hemolysis, the hemoglobin will be released from our red blood cells. So that will lead now to an increased hemoglobin level. So also that will lead to increased bilirubin level. So this one, this is not happening in gendrosic growth method. And this method is also slightly complex and has some advantages over the Evelyn Malloy, like it is not affected by pH changes, it is uh, maintaining its optical sensitivity, even if we only have very low levels of bilirubin. And for gendrosic method, what is again the accelerator? For Evelyn Malloy, that is methanol. 
So for Gendrosic Groff, we have the caffeine and sodium benzoate. So that's why we call it as caffeine benzoate. And we have the buffer, the sodium acetate. And the presence of ascorbic acid here, take note, it terminates the initial reaction and destroys the excess diazor reagent. So again, just like your Evelyn Malloy, you also have the development of the blue or the purple colored azo bilirubin. We have another type of bilirubin as mentioned earlier. This one, this is the delta bilirubin. So again, this type of bilirubin is bound to albumin in a covalent fashion. So this is tightly bound to albumin, so which renders it soluble in our blood. And it helps in monitoring the decline or the decrease of serum bilirubin following surgical remova removal of gallstones, or that is what we call as cholelithiasis. And it reacts with diazor reagent in direct bilirubin assay. So for the computation of this delta bilirubin, so we have first to add the direct and the indirect bilirubin and deduct it from the total bilirubin to get this delta bilirubin. And it is not calculated on neonatal patients because the concentration in these kinds of patients is less than or equal to 3 micromoles per liter. So this is the normal value for delta bilirubin. Okay, for the specimen considerations, we can use either serum or plasma. But the serum is preferred for Evelyn Malloy or Malloy Evelyn method. The serum samples are preferred in this method in order to minimize the possible turbidity produced by the proteins present in our plasma. And of course, fasting is preferred but not required, especially in lipemic um, specimen. Because again, this is a colorimetric method. So this is um, also affected by turbidity present in our sample. And again, the most important thing here is hemolysis should be avoided because this one could lead to an increased hemoglobin concentration leading to increased bilirubin concentration. And the most important thing that you have to consider when dealing with samples for, uh, for bilirubin analysis is that you have to protect the specimen from any form of light, either um, direct sunlight or from the artificial light that we use in the, in the laboratory. So the specimen must be protected from any form of lights and be protected from dark um, and should be measured as soon as possible within two to three hours after the collection. So this is the collection bottle for the bilirubin. So some of the uh, laboratory wrap the test tube in a paper or a carbon paper or sometimes in a foil just to protect the specimen from any source of light. And storage of this specimen, two days at room temperature as long as it is covered, one week at 4 degrees Celsius, and indefinite at negative 20 degrees Celsius. So these are the um, summary of the method. So for the Vandenberg reaction, we have here um, the B1, the other name for that is unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. The B2, it's the conjugated or the direct bilirubin. So for the solubility in water, the B1 is insoluble. That's why it's transported by albumin, whereas your B2 is soluble. And this one, this is important as well. Your B1 is um, having a high affinity to the tissues in the brain. That's why it could affect the brains, especially of the fetus, if ever these neonates have increased levels of bilirubin. So it could lead to current ecterus, this one, current ecterus. And for the B2, it has only low affinity for the um, brain tissues. And also your B1 is present in the urine. Your B2 is absent in the urine sample. So that ends my discussion. Thank you so much.